Hello and welcome to episode 18 of a DM's Guide to the Tomb of Annihilation. On today's episode, we're going to look at Sexy 2, the Stone Juggernaut. And before I forget, if you enjoy this content, remember to like and subscribe. And if you're feeling generous, there's a Patreon link in the description below. Your characters walk down from 58, the Cog of Rot, to see this message on the ceiling. 62A, Awaken the Paca. This hall is choked with dust and cobwebs. Up ahead, flickering lights dimly illuminate a larger hall running perpendicular to this one. Where the two halls meet, words have been scrawled on the ceiling in dried blood. If your characters look at the ceiling in this area right here, they can see writing on the rooftop saying, Awaken the Paca. When they arrive in this hallway, you read this out. 62B, Sloped Hall. Large puddles of grey slime spread across the floor of this 10 foot wide, gently sloping hallway. Candles flicker on riveted sconces, casting dim light across a sequence of sculpted reliefs depicting humanoids with bestial heads kneeling before a black star. At the lower end of the hall, a thick purple drape hangs wall to wall. At the upper end, the hallway terminates. So with this room, I'm not going to lie, this room gave me the most trouble in the entire Tomb of Annihilation, as in this room was the only one where I actually froze while playing it because I simply couldn't understand how it worked. But now revising this room for this episode makes a lot more sense now. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you a different view. So I'm going to show you the view from straight ahead rather than facing down. So your characters will walk through here, and you'll notice that the hallway gently slides down from west to east. And as a quick description of this room, this room is a single trap that crushes your players with this stone juggernaut here. And this stone juggernaut is named after the Paka, the former Queen of Omu, you might have met earlier in level 4. If you did meet the Paka and you got her scepter, the scepter's a magical ability is it can destroy this construct, which is very useful if your character is set off as trap. So there's a couple of ways for this trap to be set off. You have a crawlway here and you have a broken statue, which I'll explain right now. With a secret crawlway hidden behind a base relief depicting a crocodile headed humanoid holding up a trapezoidal chest, a crawlway leads to area 62D. This is where the stone juggernaut lies. Close inspection of the relief reveals the chest keyhole is real, which it is, and that the jade key found in area 53 can be used to unlock and swing it open. The jade key was within the jeweled cockroach which you find in the Packer's tomb. The lock can be picked with a successful DC 21 dexterity check made of the character using thieves tools, but if the check fails by five or more, the secret door in the west slides open and releases stone juggernaut here. So if your characters open up this crawlway with a successful check, nothing happens. However, if they make a mistake, this stone juggernaut is going to roll down the stairs and it's going to crush everyone in the room. But we'll get to the stone juggernaut in a second. So this is where I made the mistake. It's really worth explaining the room. So you have numerous depictions of humanoid with animal heads. So you could say there's a man with a tiger's head looking up skywards. There's a woman's body with the head of an eagle facing skywards. And you can explain in detail that it's a crocodile holding a chest and it appears the keyhole's real. Because when I explained this to my characters, I simply said that you see a chest on the wall. I didn't give enough description of the area. I didn't build up the room before my players got there. And that was one of the flaws I had with running this. Now let's explain this broken statue. 62C broken statue. A six foot tall statue of a leering four-armed gargoyle stands against the back wall. One of its arms has broken off and lies on the floor in front of it, its hand curled into a tight fist. The other three arms have their clawed hands open in such a way to suggest that they are meant to hold something. Carved into the wall above the statue is a riddle. Three I need, then three more. Three more still opens the door. This gargoyle statue is impervious to damage and spells, but its broken off arm is not. If three gemstones are placed in the three open hands of the statue, the hands magically close into fists that cross the gemstones to powder. The statue's hands then open again if this exercise is performed twice more so that nine gemstones are total or crushed, the hand of the broken off arm opens and a fist sized ruby appears on it. The ruby is the Eye of Zaltek, which is teleported from 62D by the sacrifice of the gems. If the ruby is plucked from the gargoyle's hand, the statue magically opens its mouth and exhales a cloud of phosphoric gas. It will fill up this space, it's exactly the same amount of space that you have for this purple curtain. And at the same time, the secret door to the west end of the hallway opens and releases the stone juggernaut, which will roll down the corridor to crush your players. 
Each creature in the gas cloud that is not immune to the poison condition will succeed in a DC 15 constitution saving throw or fall unconscious for an hour. And if you fall unconscious here, you'll be prone. When you're prone, it means that the stone juggernaut will do more damage when it rolls over you, which I'll explain shortly. With this here, this trap is a complete ruse, so you can spend 9 gemstones, and if you do collect your prize, you get crushed. The only way for you to collect the Eye of Zaltek without being attacked by the stone juggernaut is by going through the crawlway, and if you go through the back of the crawlway and you get into this room, your characters see this. The Conjox fills the height and the width of the hall. So if your characters crawl through the crawlway, they notice that this room is two-thirds full of this stone juggernaut. In the ideal scenario, your characters will crawl through the crawlway and then they'll touch it with the staff that they got from the Paca in the previous floor, and this stone juggernaut will be disintegrated and claim their pride to so the Eye of Zaltek. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to explain what stone juggernaut is in detail, then I'm going to explain what the Eye of Zaltek is and what makes it so important. Now, let's discuss the Stone Juggernaut. A Stone Juggernaut is a ruling construct imbued with enough awareness to avoid obvious dangers such as open pits and chasms. It trundles across open battlefields or rolls down dungeon corridors, crushing anyone in its path. And every Stone Juggernaut has a unique shape and appearance. So taken from the Tove Annihilation book, you can see that his appearance has big wheels at the front, tusks, and effectively this is a giant steamroller. When playing the Stone Juggernaut, the main thing you need to realise is that it has a high speed of 50 feet, but it can only go in one direction. All the Stone Juggernaut is going to do is it's going to move 50 feet down the corridor, which is about here. It will try to crush your players, and then once it's run over your players, it will come back. A general rule of thumb, it will travel 50 feet, so just before this doorway, in one turn, and then the next turn it's going to move there. Then once it reaches the end, it will move backwards, so it will be two turns down and two turns back up the way. The Stone Juggernaut has an armour class of 15, it has a large amount of hit points, 157, and due to the fact that it's a simple construct, its intelligence is very low and its charisma is very low. It has a high con, a high strength, low dexterity, and it's immune to many conditions. So it can't be blinded, charmed, deafened, exhausted, frightened, paralysed, petrified, poisoned, prone, and it's immune to damage from poison, bludging piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks and weapons that are not made from adamantium. With this, it's also got a feature called immutable form, which means that it'll always be a stone juggernaut. If you cast polymorph or anything like this, it will retain its shape. Also, if it's not going to one hit point, it will recover all its hit points at dawn. It has Siege Munch ability, however, in Annihilation this won't really count that much. What you need to look at is this paragraph right here. If you look at this paragraph, Devastating Roll, the Juggernaut can move through the space of a prone creature. A creature of space the Juggernaut enters for the first time or a turn must make a DC 17 dexterity saving throw, taking 10d10 bludgeoning damage on a fail safe or half as much on a successful one. And if you look into its attack action, which is Slam, it's a plus 10 to hit. One target, it's 3d12 plus 6 bludgeoning damage. If the target is a large or smaller creature, it must exceed a DC 17 strength saving throw or be not prone. So what happens is, this one juggernaut is going to go down the corridor, it's going to hit one of your players, make a slam attack. If it hits, your character needs to make a strength saving throw to go prone, and then he'll continue along over the top of them. Time for another one of my fun diagrams. So we've got a man right here. He's running away from the stone juggernaut. If he gets hit by the stone juggernaut and he succeeds the strength saving throw, it means he won't be knocked prone. And with the way I had run this, he successfully stopped the stone juggernaut from crushing him, can't go through him. However, I can see many DMs do this in different ways. For instance, if he succeeds the strength saving throw, he simply gets out of the way and this will continue along. In the comment section below, discuss how you do this. Would you allow the stone juggernaut to stop if the character succeeds DC 17 strength saving throw, or you simply make it go forward? Let me know in the comments below. So here's a quick once over at 462A. So remember you walk in, you have the warning on the rooftop saying Awaken the Paca in blood. And that's a clue for your characters to go to level 4 and find Queen the Paca's scepter and you can swap it. However, I find this can be quite vague. My player characters were really adamant. They went through every room in the tomb so they found this. You then have the stone statue here and it will destroy 9 gemstones and this will allow you to see the Eye of Zeltic. If you remove the Eye of Celtic from the Stone Statue, this will trigger the Juggernaut that will roll down the corridor. And it will also release gas so you'll fall asleep. You've got the Crawlway. If you go through the Crawlway, you can touch the Stone Juggernaut with the Scepter earlier on. 
and that will make the trap safe. It's the best way of doing it. However, if you find the stone crawl way, you have to access it with a key or you make a dexterity save. If you fail this dexterity save, you're going to trigger the stone juggernaut and you're going to be crossed as well. And if you do get in the back room and you collect the ISL tech from here, after destroying the stone juggernaut, you've got it. So what makes the Eye of Zaltek so important? The Eye of Zaltek, for centuries, this fist-sized ruby surmounted the Great Pyramid in Axel, capital city of the Maxine Empire. The gem is a relic of the cult of Zaltek, and its dagger-like point was plunged into the hearts of countless sacrifices. An adventuring party known as the Company of Yellow Banner entered Omu to find this Eye of Zaltek, or were never seen again. So we know that this Eye of Zaltek has the ability to resurrect the ancient dead, but it needs sacrifices. So the way that I implemented the Eye of Zaltek in my game was that people innately wouldn't know how to use it. As in if you had a spellcaster, let's say a bard or a wizard, unless the wizard is of an incredibly high level, they won't know how to use this artifact. So it allows you to use this as a plot device to go see a wizard, such as a wizard in Waterdeep, or go to Boulder's Gate. And what I also did with this was, if a character collects this, it's a massive beacon and it summons an incredible beast to come after you. So what I did was I used the Kraken. So the Kraken will now constantly follow one of my player characters throughout the entire campaign from now on. And it also worked really well with one shot that I ran in Port Nazaru, which concluded with the Kraken coming and attacking the town which I'll do a description on my one shot after I finish the Tomb of the Nine Gods. But yeah, let me know how you found the Eye of Celtic. What do you do with it in your campaign? Remember to write down in the comment section below. And thanks again for watching, guys. So just a quick announcement. The new D&D module Icewind Dale Ream of the Frostman will be released. So if you are interested in playing this new campaign, potentially you could play together as I'm hosting a couple of games on Roll20. Just keep your eyes out in the form looking for groups. And again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoy this content, remember to like and subscribe. If you're feeling generous, the Patreon link below. Have a good one, and I'll see you soon. Ciao.